Sorry about that. So what I'm going to talk about today is the original title is about polyglot programming, but after I submitted it, I realized that that's just a tiny fraction of what I'm really going to talk about. So let's set some expectations. Like I said, the title is a little bit misleading. And I'm going to talk about things that are applicable to more than just programming languages. And it's not going to be like you often hear phrases like, oh, you should learn one new language a year. And then you ask why. Well, it makes you a better programmer. It makes you a better person. It's good for your karma. No, I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, not that I disagree with it, just not what I'm going to talk about at all. And so a better name for this talk would be updating new things, adopting new things. Um, and I have over 100 slides, so it's going to be fast, and maybe you want to pay attention. So this talk has a goal, and the goal being to make adopting new things slightly easier for you, and maybe simply understanding why and when it makes sense uh, alone would be sufficient. And I also want to share a few war stories. Uh, of course, telling people about a few tricky bugs is not really a way to, to improve their productivity, so to speak, but who knows, maybe you're going to stumble upon them. So let's begin with a story. The story being, think about it, what's the largest trend in technology over the last three years? Let's spend five to 10 seconds thinking about it. Oh, we have any takers? Okay, so cloud, what else? Assembly, whoa, that never dies. HTML5, any other takes? What? JavaScript. Mobile. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what, what, what can it be. Uh, maybe many new people having access to the internet, or just many new people who had access to the internet like five years ago, just they didn't use it back then. Like my mom didn't use internet five years ago, now she does. So maybe this is the key story, or maybe that CPU cores number is going up. The Moore's law is sort of in effect, but instead of uh, raising up the clock speed, we're now doubling core counts, maybe that. Or maybe a shift to the cloud or web-based software, networked software. Or maybe just that everybody is angry at bankers. Probably all of that. And there is something else. There is something else that is not a trend in itself. It's a consequence of everything that you have said and what I have said, except maybe bankers. The trend is data volumes that we have to deal with as software engineers or DevOps people, it grows and it grows exponentially. Um, I mean, it probably has um, a lot of implications for us. So let's talk about that. So if data volumes grow, uh, because there are many more people on the internet, because there are, by the way, let's do just a little check. If you have an iOS or Android device, raise your hand. That's, that's a fair share. Yesterday I was talking to a network engineer who set up the internet here He's a very nice guy, by the way. Don't, don't say bad things about Wi-Fi here. So what he told me is like in 10 minutes, people here collectively downloaded like over one gigabyte of data, probably without realizing it. They just turned on their Wi-Fi and someone, the mail downloaded and other things. And that's not a small number in just 10 minutes. So there are all kinds of what I call intelligent hardware, it's not very intelligent. It's like things like sensors, but think about how Google Maps came to be. So Google has a lot of vehicles that drive around cities, 
uh, and basically taken like rapidly taking pictures of what's nearby, right? And then they combine all that data. But we can say that that hardware that does all that work, it's not sophisticated, it's like a camera, nothing special. But the way it is used makes it quote unquote intelligent. So that's one more uh, data source for us. So because of that, we have all kinds of new data stores uh, originating from the Amazon Dynamo paper and Google's Bigtable paper, things like that. We have like a dozen of them now, like probably more, and new ones appearing every year at least. Uh, we also have new, what I call analysis technology, things like Hadoop and Twitter Storm and everything in between that uh, they sort, you sort of kind of got to have that because think about it, if you have a lot of data but you're not making any use of it, it's useless. It's the same as not having any data or except that you're just filling up storage somewhere. Uh, the thing is with all that data and tools to analyze it, there are many very interesting opportunities. For example, if you live in a large city like say Moscow, St. Petersburg, there are all kinds of tools, say Yandex has, that analyzes traffic. It gives you a pretty good picture right on the map of what roads are congested and what, which way you should drive. So I can, I don't know, I, I have no idea where it's going to go, but it sounds exciting. So. Uh, so yeah, it's not only opportunities to display ads. Don't be misled by all those big companies that takes on a lot of venture funding just to develop a better ad-serving technology. That's, we can do better than that. So the why of, of polyglot programming or just adopting new things is because you have all these new opportunities and let's take advantage of that. So like I said, as data volumes grow, hardware designers adapt. Now we now have SSDs, uh, prices for them go down all the time. Uh, we have well, maybe not next generation, but significantly better net, network equipment um, and CPU uh, engineers and designers sort of adapt to that. Uh, data stores designers adapt as well. Like I said, we have a dozen of new quote unquote NoSQL databases. Uh, in fact, I think their key uh, idea is not about SQL at all. It is about data structure and many of them are distributed. So, but application developers, think about it. Think about how you were developing software three years ago. Is it really that different today? Or you were basically doing the same shit, just using better tools now? So, who over the last three years uh, had like a revolution in their work process? Anyone? Raise your hand. Wow, few people did. They probably found some ancient manuscript and now have superpowers. I envy you guys, but I personally haven't. Basically, I'm doing today, more or less, exactly the same shit that I have been doing three years ago. And I'm not very happy about that. Because to tackle all these new problems, I'm not sure that that technology and those approaches are really well suited. So, can you spot the problem? Hardware designers adapt, data store designers adapt, application development still stays the same. It cannot go on like this forever. So, we have to do something about it, and this is sort of the story for this talk. So, this screen is blank because I want to just do some talking to introduce the next part. Uh, I often hear, when I talk to people about this, I often hear, well, we have, we have this new awesome programming language X and new framework Y, and, but I cannot use them uh, because of uh, a list of reasons. Some of those reasons are valid, but I also notice that main, many of the reasons are not valid at all. They are just, I don't know, something you shouldn't worry about. Um, so, 
but there are basically easy ways to adopt this new programming language X or framework Y and apply it to all those new problems using those new data stores, or possibly that intelligent hardware. Uh, what is missing is cuts of engineers, managers, and so on to just adopt them. But like I said, there is a number of basically easy ways out. And I'm going to talk about it. So I'm making a number of assumptions about this crowd. Since this is a Ruby conference, um, I assume that most of you use a lot of Ruby day to day. You do a lot of things that are, have something to do with the web, not necessarily websites, but, and uh, I'm sorry, but this may sound offensive, but most Ruby programmers, they have no fucking clue about anything but Ruby. They think that Java is shit, they think that Erlang and Lisp have weird syntax, and they think that Haskell is academic nonsense, that they are just too cool to learn. And Python, Python is just inferior Ruby, right? There is nothing to see there. So, sorry for making all these assumptions, but I have seen so many people who fit this stereotype that Parts of what I'm going to talk about next, sort of, for those people. If you're not one of those people, that's great. So, the how part. Uh, one thing we need to begin with is that path of, paths of adoption for programming languages and, say, data stores are very different. Uh, they are very different because imagine that you have a typical website and now you realize that, hey, you need to cache something. It's very easy to throw in, say, memcached or Redis and be done with it. So you can use data stores for very, very specialized problems. With programming languages, it's more like, it's a significantly larger commitment. If you're going to use language X, first of all, it takes more time to learn it. Second, it takes more time to really learn it, to really learn the idioms and understand what not to do and why. And finally, say, let's say you adopted this new program language X, but your teammates haven't. That's not going to work, right? While with Redis, it sort of, it can work because your teammates just never, well, they install Redis and that's about it. So, Patterns of adoption for data stores and programming languages are very different. And if you think that, oh, but we started using MongoDB and it was easy, it's not going to be easy to adopt Erlang. For not because Erlang is bad or you are abusing it, the patterns of adoption are completely different. So second thing I hear about, well, Clojure, it, it has, it's a very elegant language, very compact, very nice. But it has this weird syntax and how I'm going to learn it and how, how Joe the program and sit, uh, sitting next to me, how he is going to learn. Well, okay, that may be a valid concern. But you need to understand that familiarity, ease of use, and simplicity are not the same thing. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this more, just keep this in mind. Um, second thing you need to do in either of the cases, if you want to follow this easy adoption track, is to pick an isolated problem. Something that basically, uh, the way some people in the Ruby community put it, uh, lets you keep your old shit around and start using real tools. So, isolated problem, if you don't have an isolated problem, you better not adopt anything. It's not going to go well. So, like I said, there are many easy ways out, so why don't we just go through each of them? Oh, by the way, like I said, the Ruby community needs to seriously chill out if they want to adopt anything about that Java is shit or Erlang has weird syntax. Maybe both of these things are true, I'm not going to judge that, but that's sort of, if you, if you have, maybe not hatred, but like, if you don't like something, you're not going to adopt it. Uh, what does that mean? That means you're missing out on all those opportunities. So if you don't like something, just, just 
relax. It's just technology. It's not going to ruin your life. Yeah, PHP is sort of maybe not very cool. Uh, but people who taught me test-driven development in 2004, they were using PHP for that. Um, and even though they no longer do, that's because they no longer work on web problems. So every time I think that I want to make a joke about PHP or something, I remember that 2004 and something called, I guess, simple test in PHP that actually opened my eyes on how software should be developed. Let's start with something like I said. If you don't have an isolated problem, you better not adapt anything. So first problem that absolutely 100% of people in the room can do is collect events across your system. And it doesn't matter if your system is just one application or many of them. There is something going on. Someone is using it, something is happening, and people need to know about it, to operate it, to understand what maybe the usage scenarios are. You need to understand what's going on. Without it, you are like a blind kitten. You, you kind of can uh, move somewhere, but that's not really, it's not a very efficient way of doing that. So collecting events across your system is something everybody both can do and should do. So let's see why this event, I think, is like, is a low-hanging fruit, basically. Because it's easy to get off the ground. You can put something together in basically an evening or two. Because, I mean, it's simpler than a block. You just take some data from some fucking socket and store it somewhere. How hard can it be? So it's very easy to get off the ground. Of course, there are other parts to it. Like I said, you need to analyze that data, and you can, can have a lot of data. But this is something that you can do. Go to your manager and say, hey, Bob. I have this working. I only spent two hours on it. And Bob is going to say, wow. Two hours? Wow. So it's an easy way to impress your Bob the manager. So it doesn't seem to be difficult initially. So if, you're talk, if you talk to your teammates and say, hey, I want to collect this, this, uh, our events using this uh, program language X and framework Y, uh, almost everybody will tell you, yeah, fine, that doesn't sound difficult. We, we, all we need is like some data store client and maybe some messaging client, and that's about it. Do it. Again, it's a, it doesn't sound difficult, so you're very likely to be, gre be, to be given a green light. Uh, next thing, it is almost immediately useful to you, because even if you don't really run complex analysis on that, you see what's going on. A lot of systems that I see, they still use, obviously, like every decent tool uses login. That's fine. But the thing is, if you, as soon as you have two machines, which isn't that special, using text files that are local to those machines, it kind of becomes kind of a hassle, right? Because you need to have two shells open. You need to sort of tail it. You can use tools like, like Ganglia and Splunk, and they are great. They are certainly part of this but they don't know anything about like, the semantics of your system. They can only collect uh, uh, operational data. Uh, you still need to collect more than that. Uh, and like I said, because it's an easy sell, you can say, oh, we can use that author.bs framework, which is fast and asynchronous and scales. Uh, so it's an easy way. If you're an author BS fan, uh, that's an easy way to sneak it into the house. Uh, one more thing that I personally find appealing about this is this is, this is like the easiest way to get introduced to messaging. So, and whether, why you should care about messaging is a, like a whole separate talk. Uh, I thought that another guy is going to give it, so that's why I didn't submit my second one. So, but it has value. So, another problem that you can pick, which is sort of follows this one, which is great, right? You first adopted other BS for this thing, and then you want to adopt it for something else, uh, is you need to analyze that data. Let's talk about that. So, 
There are many tools to choose from. Hadoop being the most famous one, it's not without issues, but there are now like, it's like in NoSQL data stores, a new Hadoop every couple of months. Uh, some of them are nice, like I tried Twitter Storm. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, so, in any case, data volumes over time, because like I said, this is a tectonic shift in technology, they're going to drive you away from Ruby and Python. It, it has nothing to do with the way that MRI is a piece of shit. Uh, it has something to do with the fact that you cannot bolt on concurrency support on top of the existing language. That's why Ruby and Python, they're not going to have great concurrency support anytime soon, if ever. So you need something else to make use of all those cores um, and all that network bandwidth available to you. Uh, one more nice thing is that it is completely isolated from your, say, typical web stuff, right? You can keep it as a separate app forever. It, I mean, even people who are, like, insane not going to put this into their Rails app. Right? Nobody does analysis in their web app, I hope. Uh, so again, this is a sort of a low-hanging fruit. So next problem is you can test existing systems, but this is sort of, I guess, a boring part. Everybody knows that you can test Java code with our spec or with Scala specs or with Mitch and DSLs and Clojure or with something else. One more on hanging through these APIs. Uh, now, uh, I can imagine a question, but Michael, ever since Rails, what, 1.2, we have this nice thing called resources, which sort of gives you API, at least adjacent an API. Isn't that enough? Well, in many cases, it is enough, and well-designed API is so certainly aligned with the rest of your application most of the time. But the thing is, at some point, your API is going to need something that is, does not really feed resources. Uh, or, like in case of Twitter, your API is going to have, like, at some point it took like 80% of their traffic or something like that. Their websites are still running Ruby. They didn't abandon it and they have no plans to. But their API is in Scala. Because there is no way Ruby can handle that load. It's just, it's just economically non-viable. Uh, so, yeah, having an API as a separate app, it's a, uh, there are reasons for doing so. Maybe not every app requires them, but many do. Um, so, yeah, I sort of got ahead of myself. And almost always, it is, an, it is a low-hanging fruit, because if you decide to migrate your API, say, from Ruby to Scala, you're implementing the system you already have. You already know it. You already, what, you already know what it can and cannot do, right? So it's sort of like, it's a significantly simpler problem because you already did all the hard parts, which is figuring out what your API should look like and what does work well and what doesn't. Uh, so for APIs, Again, lots of tools are available. You can use Scala with this nice play framework, which is very nice with Java as well, in my opinion. You can use Clojure with, if you use, choose to use Clojure, I recommend Noir, even though there are like dozens of other web frameworks that are Sinatra clones, basically. Uh, you can use Erlang with uh, application slash web servers like Mistletine and I recommend Cowboy. Uh, Basically, for any programming language X, there is now a Sinatra clone called Y, and you can use it. So, one more interesting part, because we were talking about um, hardware or in, whether it is intelligent or not, let's see what you can do in that space. Because embedded devices, they have, have been around forever, basically. And the question is, aren't we just limited to C and Lua, which was designed for embedding? Like, what other options do we have? Any takers? Okay, for some, for some cases, you probably can use .NET. In some cases, like Android, you can use Java and probably other JVM languages. Although Dalvik is not really a JVM. It doesn't have the JIT. So you have to understand that. 
it won't run JRuby very, very well because it, it is missing the key optimization component. Uh, but yeah, but it's still a small percentage. As popular as Android is, it's still a tiny drop in the bucket in the overall hardware landscape, right? Um, so, no, we're not. Let's think about what our other choices are. Well, maybe our choice is to take some nice programming language, uh, something script, and compile it down to C, and then use GCC to compile it down to native code and run that. How does that sound? That's kind of messy, right? I mean, no, that's not going to work. Okay. Okay. Right, this one works. So people with iOS and Android devices, what kind of CPUs are those, do those things run? Do you know? Yes, they run ARM. Uh, and actually a lot of devices these days run ARM because ARM, it's not just one thing. It's like a giant family of CPUs. There are IRMs and all kinds of hardware. Uh, so what we need to find, we need to find a reasonably nice programming language, which is like sort of better than C, which is not that hard, like, right? Uh, and that runs on ARM. Any options? Okay, D, okay, maybe D is an option. Any other? Erlang. Well, Erlang actually was born at a project that had a lot of hardware in it. Okay, sure. Any other takers? <laughs> actually, you are right. The reason why you are right, think about it. What powers, I don't know what that browser is called on Android, but let's say it's Chrome Mobile or something like that. Uh, so, what JavaScript engine does it have? It has libv8. WebKit is not a JavaScript engine. Uh, it has libv8. So maybe, just maybe, we can run libv8 on ARM? What, what would that give us? That would give us this nice programming language called JavaScript, which is, I kind of like it. I know many people don't, which maybe is better than C Lua, at least for some things. Right. So libv8, but with libv8 you can also use CoffeeScript, script, and I'm sure this number of X script is only going to grow over time. So you don't have to be genius to figure out that you can embed libv8 on a device. But a lot of people don't do that and they still spend oceans of time doing things in C that shouldn't be done in C really. So how to integrate? Uh, you can easily integrate two apps using messaging. Uh, it's kind of, it's not a problem, it is a solution, but I think it fits this overall problem fairly well. So let's talk about that next. So how to integrate? One option is using messaging, and if you don't really understand what messaging is, uh, I'm going to, you're going to see what the difference is. Or also using a shared data store. Like, it's so easy. Let's just shovel all our data into this table in one app and read it the, in the other app or many other apps. It sounds so easy that so many people do it, and in some cases, that's exactly what you need. But it's also very dangerous. Uh, it is dangerous because someday this other app that used to only read data is going to write data. And now you have this shared state problem that is also distributed because your database lives on a separate machine and network connection can go down. This is a lot of fun, especially for Ruby programmers. Uh, because it doesn't involve Rails, it's not fancy, it's hard to debug, you have to know how to use many tools that are ugly and not user-friendly, and yeah, that's kind of... It sends shivers down your spine as a Ruby programmer, right? Uh, there is a book called Enterprise Integration Patterns. It has nothing to do with the word enterprise, so don't let it scare you away. It's just a great book on integration patterns in general, and it discusses shared database, messaging, and everything in between. So read that. It is a must read in this day and age. So let's move on to messaging. Uh, what messaging is, I usually refer to it as a glue without shared state. So basically one app sends data to the other app. It can be directly or via some broker. It doesn't really matter. The thing is they don't really share any state. 
for those of you who are fans of Erlang and the actor's concurrency model, this, this kind of makes sense. Like, this sounds cool. It's like actors at the application level? Wow, I guess I angry someone. Some, okay, anyway. So one more thing that it gives you, it gives you interoperability between many technologies. Pretty much any technology, like if you can use JSON and open sockets, that's messaging right there. HTTP is a form of messaging, arguably a very limited and specialized one, but it is. <laughs> really? I have to close it like really, really, hold it really, really close. Uh, so there are Hornet MQ, Active MQ, there are things like Clam MQ, and I think, I'm pretty sure there is a technology called MQ MQ, I'm just not aware of it. And there are other MQs and abbreviations like that. So, uh, yeah. But please consider not using shared databases for messaging because I have seen Redis being heavily abused for that. Redis is a great data store, but it, it's still a data store. PopSub maybe get you some of that functionality, but it, you will quickly overgrow it. So don't, don't ignore RabbitMQ and ZeroMQ because you think that, oh, all I need is Redis and I already use Redis and that kind of thing. So don't abuse databases for this thing. So adoption. Now, you have all these problems. You have all these uh, easy ways out. Now you know how to do it and thinking, oh, I'm going to finally start using programming language X with the framework Y. Well, sort of. There are things that can get in the way. First of all, it's that familiarity versus ease of use versus simplicity thing. They are all not the same thing. For example, Python is very similar to Ruby. Um, so it's sort of very easy to learn for someone familiar with Ruby. Um, I'm not going to judge whether Python is easy to use or not, but the thing is, it's not always simple. And that's why in version three, they're fixing a lot of things in the language that are sort of counterintuitive, proven to not work well. Uh, and all the old languages are like that. Ruby is no exception. So there is a great talk by Rich Hickey, the author of Clojure. It was published like two days ago. I watched it in the airport in Moscow on the way here about ease of use versus simplicity. It, it, it was at the Strange Loop conference. It, it is hosted on infoq.com, so go there and just type in Rich Hickey and you will find it. It's a great talk, absolutely. It explains why familiarity, ease of use, and simplicity are not the same thing, but people sort of think they are, and they think that, hey, if this programming language X sort of looks weird, then it must be completely impenetrable, like you cannot learn it. Very often, it just, it just doesn't matter. And the simplicity aspect is hidden, you cannot immediately see it, and this is what matters. So one more thing is tried and true is a good thing. So if you're going to adopt, say, .NET or the JVM, that's a great idea. You shouldn't be ashamed of it, absolutely. Maybe Hiker News won't sort of approve that, but who the fuck cares? Uh, so use pilot projects, like all these things, all these isolated problems. You should adopt the movie industry or the television industry, rather, approach to pilot projects when you take something, build something small, evaluate it, build something slightly larger, and maybe after second or third project, you can like, place back bets, big bets, so to speak on some technology. Now, finally, in the adoption cycle, you need to really understand what the hell is going on. And I'm not going to, I, there will be some examples later, uh, but this is absolutely crucial. If you don't understand how your tools work, one day it will bite you. So let's talk about this most important part, learn how your tools really work. And I'm going to tell you a little war story. So I worked with a bunch of people who, they're really smart guys, and they basically tried to use Hadoop to do large scale, say, data processing. And Hadoop is sort of nice, and people are smart, so what, what could possibly go wrong? Well, apparently, Hadoop clusters, nodes like would go down sporadically, and there is nothing in the log, and no, nobody can understand what the hell is going on. And 
there are many people apparently stumbling into this problem. And what is going on? So you, you see this Xivers thing that is also misspelled. What the heck is that? This is one of the configuration options of, I'm not sure if whether it is Hadoop itself or HDFS. Basically, it, uh, it is some kind of limit, and once Hadoop node crosses it, it sort of falls down on its ass. Uh, said it explicitly, they actually typed it correctly. But Yahoo engineer, uh, coming from some non-native English, non-English non speaking country, misspelled it, and all those people were screwed because obviously this configuration option didn't really apply. That's why the clusters kept go down. Uh, and people who figured out what the hell was going on were people who were reasonably familiar with Hadoop internals, and fortunately they've written some blog posts about it. So this is just one example when a very large project can have pretty trivial problems, like the default wasn't good enough. Uh, you need to understand what is going on. Second one, there's this popular thing. Uh, oh, by the way, how many of you have seen this, this uh, YouTube video that MongoDB is web scale? So, really? Just so? Guys, after this talk, go to YouTube and Google for MongoDB is web scale. It's just like five minutes. You will absolutely love it. So the thing is, uh, MongoDB is often criticized for like the server part of things, like it didn't have journaling before some version, things like that. And it sort of flushes buffers to disk asynchronously. Uh, it doesn't really matter as much as some other things that for some reason almost nobody discusses. The problem is being, let's say you have an action that creates a blog post. And you are using active record with say Postgres. What happens if insert fails for some reason? Say you violated a constraint you see an exception, right? So it's pretty obvious that something went wrong. With MongoDB and Mongoid with default settings, what do you think is going to happen? Hmm? Right, nothing, absolutely nothing. Your data is not stored, there is no exception. Everything is fine. Do you know why? Any takers? You are right, but please explain how that works. Okay, Mongo has this thing which in the Java driver is called write concern. And you can set it to like four levels. And by default it is, I think, level zero, which means at level zero, Mongo client won't even check server response. So it just fires some data, it doesn't wait for response. If there is a problem with persistent something, you don't even know about it. How fucked up is that? And of course, you can, you can set it to safe and then it will actually get the response. I mean, this is a nice feature, right? You have to configure it to get the response from your database. Uh, there are also other levels that are like the, in the Dynamo model, the W parameter, when you write to multiple machines and they all have to accept the write for it to be successful. But the default is extremely unsafe. It doesn't really matter how the Mongo server works and whether it has journaling if your client won't notify you about issues. You absolutely have to know how the heck it works. I learned about it as I was writing my closure layer on top of the Java driver and I was seriously scared that all this time, at least for some things, I have been using this absolutely fucked up setting. So some people in New York in high tech industry are cowboys, so be aware of that because you're using their shit and it works like this. So one more story. Imagine that you have a GVM app and every once in a while it needs to run a sub-process. Nothing special, just, just a sub-process and that sub-process may produce, in some cases it produces like maybe a few hundred bytes of output and on some other it may produce megabytes of, of data. It just prints it to standard out. So, in a system like this, I once noticed that the JVM sort of got stuck. One thread that did that shell out, so to speak. Uh, now, any takers, what may be going on? Okay, this is a Ruby conference, right? So the way Java IO system works is everything abstracted across, uh, everything is designed as a stream, basically, 
but in practice, people use buffered versions of them. So there is a buffer, which is just, a, say, a piece of memory, and you fill it, and then you have to drain it. And if you don't drain it, one, once it's full, you obviously cannot write anything. So it's not dynamically adjusted. So what happened in that particular case, one standard output size uh, was larger than the default buffer size, it just stopped accepting any input. And that's why the process never finished. It was waiting for data that it, it written to standard output to be taken from there. And the JVM was waiting for this process to finish. So this is one more interesting case. Fortunately, it, was, it wasn't found in production. So, uh, And of course, the list goes on and on. And there, I'm sure people in the audience have more interesting stories to share. Now, the next thing you have to do is look for downsides. This is sort of, this is actually part of know how your tools work uh, section. So, first of all, uh, we hear that technology X is awesome and framework Y is awesome and everything is great and everything is so nice and easy to use. Guess what? Not everything is awesome. So, I, don't ju I just don't get the optimism of some people in the tech community. Second, again, I'm really sorry I have to tell you this, but Hacker News shouldn't be your source of news or at least like something where you really draw opinions from. Maybe it's fine as a way to market your open source project or, and maybe there is something interesting to read every once in a while. But I know people who like spend two hours a day on Hacker News. I just don't get it. Uh, so, learn what tools, tools that you use were created for some very specific problem. Erlang was created for distributed systems and uh, telecom software that was embedded into switches and things like that. Uh, this means that designers of Erlang had to make certain trade-offs. Because you cannot possibly build something that works excellent in every case. This also means that for some other problems, Erlang probably won't do very well. Erlang has this, uh, the perception of Erlang, at least in the Ruby world, that it is, it is fast, that it it's scalable. Sure, it is scalable, but it's not that fast. It's significantly faster than Ruby and Python, but it's nowhere near Java. A lot of people don't know that. Second thing why the er Erlang is so great under like extremely heavy load is the way its garbage collector works and the way uh, the schedule, scheduling of Erlang processes happens in the Erlang VM. It's not ma managed by the OS, which means it can be heavily optimized for cases that do not never happen on the desktop, for example, and OS never tries to do that, but Erlang designers sort of did that, and that's why it works great. So obviously, if you, say, write a Photoshop in Erlang, it's probably not going to go very well because putting aside all the algorithm performance concerns, it's just, it's a very different environment. So learn what the tools that were, uh, that you're going to adopt, what they were created for, because this tells you how they are supposed to be used. So remember that problems come up over time, and if after working with the programming language X, you don't find any issues, it doesn't mean there are no any issues. Sometimes you need to spend several months, and then you will figure out that maybe Scala standard libraries actors are awesome, but their error handling is sort of not very good, and that ruins your whole, uh, well, not project, but a particular application. So, uh, so what this means, you need to, the best way to learn is to just ask people with real world experience. Fortunately, you can do this on the mailing list. It's not that hard in this day and age. So absolutely do that. Uh, one more thing is if, if you're going to adopt a programming language, remember that they need time to stabilize. What do I mean by that? I, I don't mean the situation Rubinius in is right now. It's like under active development, things break, it, it is expected. It's going to be a lot better in a few months. That's for sure. No, that's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is what designers of Scala did in 2.9, or 2.8, I'm sorry, and 
designers of Plosure did in 1.3. They basically did some backwards and compatible changes. They're not that big of, big of a deal. But still, sometimes it's very inconvenient to realize that, oops, you cannot like upgrade by just replacing the jar. No, you have some work to do. So, but so, of course, certainly after a certain point, languages stop changing fast. So by the way, speaking of which, if you're going to adopt Google Go, I'm not really sure now it's the right time because it like changes every couple of weeks or so. Again, maybe I'm misinformed, but that's just an example. So, final words. Uh, you can do it. You can adopt all those things. Not because they're cool, because they do, they can do a lot for you. And by the way, I didn't provide many examples of what they really can do for you, but trust me. JVM is the way to go, probably the easiest thing to adopt in general. Uh, many languages to choose from, excellent tools, cross-platform, very well-known, well-respected, and it's just a great VM. Uh, messaging is the way to go. Again, I'm biased towards messaging, but compared to the alternative, which is shared databases, it's certainly a better choice. There is no excuse for not using JRuby. I see that there is sort of, because of this Java is shit, uh, meme in the Ruby community, JRuby is often dragged into that. People say, oh, it's, it's Java, it's JVM, it, it cannot be good. Actually, JRuby is the best Ruby implementation out there. Um, for basic, if, unless your code really depends on C extensions, it's a drop-in replacement. Java integration is absolutely seamless, and a lot of, a good Java library would feel like a good Ruby library, except that it's typically works a lot better and is actually stable and maintained. Often by vendors like RabbitMQ Java drivers, obviously developed by the RabbitMQ guys, VirtualBox Java client is developed by Oracle and so on. And sometimes your best choice is to not adopt anything new. Thank you very much.